This lecture is covering cellular respiration. There are four steps to cellular respiration we're going to talk about. There is a supplemental video on electron carriers that you need to watch. There will also be a video on fermentation that you need to watch and then a little um, video of interest on glycolysis and cancer cells. Cellular respiration is a series of redox reactions. The overall goal is to make lots of ATP energy for the cell. And the ATP energy is made from the energy stored in electrons. And that's where the redox reactions come in. So redox stands for reduction, oxidation, which are coupled reactions where some molecules gain electrons, some molecules lose electrons. The source of, <coughs> excuse me, these electrons is the food you eat. So we're going to see how glucose is broken down to make um, electron carriers and glucose is oxidized, which means it loses electrons to make eventually carbon dioxide. And oxygen is reduced, which means it gains electrons and is eventually reduced to water. Okay. So again, really important for you to go watch the video on redox reactions and understand this movement of electrons. This lecture is going to focus on the four stages of cellular respiration. So this overall get this all this off. So this overall equation takes into account about 20 steps for metabolic pathways. Um, the overall equation has a delta G of negative 686, oops, 86 kcals per mole. So it's an exergonic energy releasing. And don't confuse this word respiration with breathing. Yes, in fact, um, we breathe, and we breathe in oxygen, and we breathe out CO2. So this is where the term respiration comes in. But understand that all eukaryotes do it, and you don't really think about plants breathing, but they definitely do cellular respiration. So they're definitely using oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. This, because we use oxygen, is called aerobic. Aerobic means with air, cellular respiration. When you watch the video on fermentation, I'll talk a little bit about anaerobic respiration. And finally, I don't want you to get hung up on this number of 36 ATP. You're going to see numbers between 30, 32 to 38 ATP. And it all depends on the textbook or the resources or the source's author. Um, I recently read where we may be over calculating how many ATP. It may be closer to 28. The point is we're making lots of ATP through aerobic cellular respiration. There are four stages, glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, or we call it the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA. We'll go through this more in a minute. Um, Krebs cycle, also called 
the citric acid cycle, also in the old days called the trichloroacetic acid cycle. Okay. And finally, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis, which together is also called oxidative phosphorylation. So I suggest in addition to taking these notes, you print out this chart if you don't have it already, um, because you need to know where these four processes happen, the starting reactants, the end products, if it makes energy, and the electron carriers. So we'll go through this at each step to fill out. Um, and I want you at the end to be able to connect it to this overall reaction. So let's start with where does this all happen? So glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm or the cytosol. Cytoplasm is more of a general term. Cytosol is important for eukaryotes because it's the cytoplasm minus all the organelles like mitochondria. So you'll see that I get lazy and sometimes use them interchangeably. The mitochondrion, which is singular or mitochondria plural, is where the steps two, three, and four happen. So in the mitochondria, steps two and three happen in the matrix and steps four, stage four happens on the inner membrane. Ooh. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit close up. Mitochondria, you have learned, is where ATP is made. And now we're learning about the process of making ATP, which is cellular respiration. You hopefully also learned that mitochondria's structure is super important and that it has two membranes, outer membrane and an inner membrane. Okay. So the, whoops, the outer membrane is thought to be the result of endosymbiosis. So this is something you've learned previously, but I want to um, reiterate it here. So the theory of endosymbiosis is that mitochondria and chloroplasts were once free-living prokaryotic cells that were taken in You've got your little mitochondria here, little guy, that was taken in by a larger eukaryotic cell. And the larger eukaryotic cell wrapped its membrane around, brought the mitochondria in, that's the endo part inside, and they lived happily ever after. That's the symbiosis, living together. Okay. This is important because if you start thinking about your other organelles in eukaryotic cells, they're all single membraned, except for chloroplasts. And we'll talk again about this um, theory of endosymbiosis when we talk about chloroplasts. What I want you to see, besides having this double membrane, if you look down here, it says mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondria actually have their own circular DNA. Prokaryotic cells have circular DNA. So this mitochondrial DNA supports this idea that mitochondria were once free-living prokaryotes. And also, which is not shown in here, mitochondria have ribosomes. And these ribosomes do the same thing as our ribosomes produce proteins, but structurally they are different and they are more like prokaryotic ribosomes 
than eukaryotic ribosomes. So to support the theory of endosymbiosis, mitochondria have this outer membrane, or two membranes total. They have DNA and they have ribosomes. And their DNA and their ribosomes are very similar in structure to prokaryotic cells and very different in structure from eukaryotic cells. Okay. This will definitely be a concept on the final exam. All right, let's look at this inner membrane, which used to be the prokaryotic cellular membrane before the mitochondria was taken in. And you can see it has a lot of folds, and these are called cristae. So the folds give it more surface area, right? So more membrane than if you were just a circle. And that allows for more cellular respiration to happen. Because on the cristae, if you look over at this mitochondria, there is a series of proteins called the electron transport chain that are located, they're embedded on that inner membrane. What's really cool is this is exactly how some prokaryotes that do aerobic respiration do photo, uh, do cellular respiration. So they have, if this is your prokaryote, they'll have little regions where the plasma membrane folds in and they can set up the electron transport chain. So though prokaryotes don't have these specific organelles, remember they still do most of the same types of metabolism and um, synthesis that eukaryotic cells do. They just have to do it on one membrane that has lots of folds in it just like the cristae of the mitochondria. Matrix, you're going to see a lot. That is this inner space, this fluid, within the inner membrane. And we're also going to point out the, uh, what happens in the intermembrane space which is the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. There's a super cool video that I've posted in this module um, from a, a production called Bioflix. Um, you've hopefully seen um, some of the other Bioflix ones. I think it's a really good illustration of cellular respiration. I highly, highly encourage you to watch it because it's an animation so it moves instead of showing everything static like we do on PowerPoints. All right, so you're gonna see the chart pop up and the different parts filled in. I'm not gonna pause here, but you can, um, or I guess I should say, I suggest you pause here, fill out your chart, or if you've been filling it out, double check. So this part is telling you where these processes happen. The cytoplasm, the mitochondrial matrix, and on the mitochondrial inner membrane. Alright, so the first thing we have to do, since the first step is glycolysis, is we have to get glucose. Glucose, oops. Into the cell. Okay. And there are glucose transporters on the plasma membrane that bring glucose in. And many of these transporters are carrier proteins. They're called GLUT for glucose transporters and they work by facilitated diffusion. There are other types of glucose transporters. We're not focused on this part, but I want you to think about, you've got to get glucose into the cell across that plasma membrane, and glucose is too big and too polar to diffuse directly. So the first stage is glycolysis, which literally means the splitting of 
glucose. And so the big overall reaction is that you take glucose and you go through a series of steps, which I'll show you in a minute, and you make two pyruvate molecules, you make some ATP, and you make some NADH electron carriers. So the first thing I want you to see is that it takes, whoops, it takes energy and makes energy. So when we talk about glycolysis, we say that two ATP molecules are produced. Net means overall. Okay, we have to use two, we make four, two is the overall um, output. Glycolysis, you can see there are 10 different enzymes. And you do not need to know any of these. But I want you to see what's going on. So we have our glucose molecule. And we add ATP into the reaction. And it puts a phosphate. So remember we talked about energy coupling and moving that phosphate around to give molecules energy. This is exactly what is happening. So here's that phosphate. And in another step, we use another ATP molecule. And so now this is fructose 1,6-bis phosphate. So by, like bicycle means two. So this sugar, which has gone from glucose to now fructose, has two phosphates on it. And then as you come down here, what happens is we split this molecule into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Oops. Okay, so we still got a phosphate. And dihydroxy, di, dihydroxy acetone phosphate, which is another phosphate. But the big picture that I want you to see, instead of worrying about all these crazy words, is that we've gone from six carbons to two molecules Mm, it's doing this with three carbons each. So we haven't lost any carbons. We've just split glucose into three carbon molecule. Um, dihy dihydroxyacetone phosphate gets converted to um, G3P okay, and follows the rest of this pathway. So from here on, you're really multiplying everything by two. So as you can see, now they're highlighting the phosphates that we had already circled because now this phosphate is going to get transferred on to ADP to make ATP. And again, this phosphate over here, are you following it right? Gets transferred to make another ATP molecule, right? We're also making NADH, which as it says here is a carrier of two electrons. So if you're starting to get confused about this electron carrier, I would pause here, I'd go watch the electron carrier video so that you're understanding what the importance of NADH and FADH2. So what I want to emphasize is that ATP here is generated by substrate level phosphorylation. And we talked about this earlier this semester, passing the phosphates, giving things energy, right? You see lots of delta Gs, so you could add them all up and look at the overall reaction. These are all energy coupling, right? We're coupling 
these different reactions um, with energy to make things happen and eventually we're making back ATP. We're going to talk a lot um, when we get into photosynthesis as well as about the ways we can make ATP. So again, substrate level phosphorylation is just taking the phosphate from a molecule, that's all that substrate means, with my little P, with my little phosphate, and transferring it and transferring the phosphate, in this case, to ADP. Remember that ADP means di, which is two, so we've got bi, which is two, and di, which is two, and now we make ATP, which is triphosphate, so it has three. That's our energy molecule. So here you go, glycolysis, you start with glucose, you produce two pyruvate molecules, you produce overall two ATP, and you produce two NADH electron carriers. Now we're going to move the pyruvate into the mitochondria. So remember we're out here in the cytosol, we've made pyruvate, and mitochondria have the, oops, the outer and the inner membrane. So this molecule actually has to fit or move through two membranes. It moves through the outer membrane via something called a porin. And in this case, you've learned about aquaporins, which are tunnels for water. This porin is another channel protein. It's a big one, so it allows this three carbon molecule. Um, and it's a non-selective channel. So pyruvate can just diffuse, well, facilitate a diffusion right on through there. And then there's a specific mitochondrial pyruvate carrier protein that again uses facilitated diffusion to move the mitochondria, uh, to move the pyruvate through the inner membrane. And so what happens to pyruvate is there's an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Complex means it's actually multiple proteins that come together to make this enzyme. So this enzyme has quaternary protein structure. And what happens is we basically remove a carbon into carbon dioxide. So we're making carbon dioxide. We're putting this CoA piece onto it and the product is acetyl-CoA. So for every pyruvate, you make one acetyl-CoA. Remember that for one molecule of glucose, you're making two pyruvates, so all of this is by two. And we also make another NADH. So we're converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. This is happening in the matrix of the mitochondria. We're producing carbon dioxide. We're producing an electron carrier. We're producing acetyl-CoA. This is all times two per glucose. And this acetyl-CoA is gonna feed right into the next stage, which is called the citric acid cycle. So let's summarize this. What I want you to see is that we take the end product from glycolysis and that becomes the starting product for the next step. We take the pyruvate, we make acetyl-CoA and CO2. CO2 is a waste product or a byproduct. So it's not gonna be used any further it's going to diffuse into your bloodstream and you're gonna breathe it out. 
We're also making some NADH electron carriers. There is no ATP made at this step. Okay. So let's move on to the citric acid cycle. Again, this is happening in your mitochondrial matrix. We're talking about pyruvate from glycolysis, but I want you to know that when you eat stuff with fats, fatty acids can also feed into this pathway. And um, I showed you an image in um, class where we looked in proteins feed into these pathways at some point and other carbohydrates besides glucose feed in. So all those nutrients that you need can feed in to cellular respiration at some point and help make ATP. I want you to see that we're going to be making more electron carriers, NADH, another one called FADH2. We're going to be producing some more CO2 waste product. And the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, this is a cycle. So it goes round and round and round and round. Okay. Acetyl-CoA has two carbons. So in order to allow this citric acid cycle to keep going, we have to get rid of those two carbons so that it can pick up another two carbons and cycle it through. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Okay. So here we start, acetyl-CoA. Okay. Everything in yellow um, are the names of the molecules. All the yellow to red arrows represent individual enzymes. Okay. So you can see in purple, that we make some electron carriers. You can see in green down here, we make ATP. And in blue, we make CO2. This is for one turn of the cycle. We're going to have two acetyl-CoA, so we're always going to do this twice. And the video from Bioflix kind of shows you this movement of carbons. And so you could, um, in biochemistry, probably follow the pathway of the carbons. But what I want you to see is that you start with a four carbon molecule. You add your two carbons from acetyl-CoA. You rearrange things and you lose those two carbons and eventually you make oxoal ox oxaloacetate back. That's why it's a cycle. What you start with, you end up with. ATP here, again, is made by substrate level phosphorylation. Um, in this case, we're actually using um, another uh, nucleotide energy molecule called GTP, but we're not going to get into those details because we're concerned about the ATP. All right, so let's put this into your chart. So you take the two acetyl-CoA molecules from the pyruvate conversion. That is your starting substrate for citric acid. Overall, you produce four carbon dioxides, two ATP, six NADH, and two FADH2 electron carriers. Okay. We're gonna now focus on these electron carriers for a second. And just note, again, remember, there's a different um, video that really helps you understand these, but these are kind of like a taxi in that they pick up electrons and they drive them somewhere else and they release the electrons. And what I want you to notice is H plus, oops, that was not H plus, H plus and E minus go together. This is hydrogen, NADH. 
Remember that hydrogen from your periodic table is one and one, which means it has one proton and one electron. And so we write the proton from hydrogen as H plus so that we know where it came from. The electrons here have energy. So electron carriers are actually carrying energy, a different form, not ATP, but energy to another part of the cell. All right, so again, we're gonna take all these electron carriers. Those are gonna be our starting compounds for oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is really broken down into two um, parts. The electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. Okay, and that's shown here. So this part is the electron transport chain, and then when we talk about synthesizing ATP, that's chemiosmosis. Right here, okay, you can see NADH and FADH2. So our electron carriers are coming in and the yellow line, arrows, I should say, represent the movement of electrons. And we're going to zoom in on this in just a second. But overall, what I want you to see, so here's, we're in the matrix, right? That's where your NADH and FADH2 were made. They are going to release the electrons to these purple proteins, they now become oxidized. They have lost their electrons. And these electrons are going to move through the electron transport chain. And the electrons provide energy to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane. Let's put across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. So this part in orange is the intermembrane space because up here somewhere is the outer membrane. Okay, so visualize your mitochondria so that you can see we are going to now make this hydrogen ion gradient and you know that when you build up lots of a molecule it can then come back through facilitated diffusion and in this case the facilitated diffusion is going to do work and make ATP. That's the chemiosmosis part. Alright, so let's take a step back and look at the electron transport chain. Okay. The electron transport chain is a series of integral and peripheral membrane proteins which you can see here. Okay. You do not need to know the names, wow, that was interesting, of all these different proteins. What I want you to understand is that what's happening, you can see free energy per electron, is we start out with a lot of energy, and as the electrons are moved, it loses energy. So that energy is being used to pump these hydrogens. So it is a form of active transport. It's just not using ATP because we want to make ATP. The other thing I want you to notice about these electron um, pro or, um, proteins in the electron transport chain is they go from low to high electronegativity. Oh look, another term we talked about earlier in the semester. So you know about electronegativity because of water. Oxygen is more electronegative. It attracts the electrons stronger than hydrogen, and that's why water is a polar molecule. 
Well, in this case, oxygen has the highest electronegativity value. So the electrons are able to move because each protein can attract the electrons a little bit more. Oxygen, which we write as O2 because it's a gas, is the ultimate electron acceptor. Okay. It is where we dump all of our electrons on and this is where water is made. So yes, if you look back, there is water made in other stages of cellular respiration. This is the one we count the most because this is where oxygen is input and the result is water is made. These are a whole series of redox reactions because that's how you move electrons. And again, we're going from lower to higher electronegativity with oxygen being the ultimate acceptor. So this is why you die if you don't breathe. Because if you don't breathe, you don't get oxygen into your body, which means if you block this, the electrons back up, can't make this gradient, can't form ATP, you have no energy, you die. All right, another picture, I really like this one, of the electron transport chain. Again, here are our electron carriers. They're giving energy to these molecules. The molecules are passing the electrons along. They're pumping hydrogens. They're creating a hydrogen gradient. in the intermembrane space. The electrons are eventually bound to oxygen, which makes water. We also have hydrogen ions here that obviously are needed for water because water is H2O. Okay. But you have to have the combination of the hydrogen ions and the electrons. All right, so the purpose of the electron transport chain is to make this proton gradient, this hydrogen gradient. So remember, we also call this proton. And we call this a proton motive force. And that proton motive force, this buildup of protons, then comes down through this enzyme called ATP synthase. And this is the only enzyme you have to know the name of. You've got to know the name of ATP synthase. Synthesis means make something, ACE means enzyme, and you're making ATP. So the proton motive force, the hydrogens come down here, they give energy to this molecule, this enzyme, to add a phosphate group to ADP to make ATP. This is a form of facilitated diffusion. So we've used the energy of the electrons to eventually make ATP. Chemiosmosis, I know it's a little confusing because it's not about water, but it's technically a chemical push. Okay, so osmosis means the pushing of, of water. The way we produce ATP here is called oxidative phosphorylation. So let's I'll write it over here. So ATP is made by oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. 
ATP synthase, there's your enzyme name, is this, it has this rotor, and, and I highly encourage you to watch these two little videos. Um, they're pretty cool, and they show how this um, ATP synthase works. But basically, the hydrogens move, and you can think of it kind of like those, um, if you've ever seen those machines where a ball drops to the top and it spins around, that's what's happening. And it's creating this movement that connects the phosphate to the ATP to make ATP. Okay. So ATP is made by oxidative phosphorylation. We're phosphorylating it, we're adding a phosphate, but it's oxidative because it's these redox reactions that allow the energy to make the ATP. So the phosphate, inorganic phosphate here, is from somewhere in the cell. Something's released a phosphate. It's not hooked to another molecule. That's why it's not substrate level phosphorylation. It's free floating phosphates. Um, oops. All right, so we can fill in the rest of our chart. We have used oxygen, we have made water, and we've made a whole lot of ATP. The electron carriers are all used up. And this is the chart that you want to practice understanding where things happen, start, end, who's making energy, who's making electron carriers. Right? So again, overall reaction. You take food, you need oxygen, you make energy, and you make carbon dioxide. It's called respiration because we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. But plants do this as well. Um, protists, amoebas, and paramecium's and those little guys do it as well. Fungi do it as well. And they're not breathing with lungs like we think. So don't get fooled with that respiration term. Okay. Again, you're going to see lots of different numbers for eight. ATP. I don't ever ask what specific numbers. Um, I do like you to understand that we start with six carbons and we release six carbons. The oxygen is reduced to water, so those go together. And I think this is a nice um, image to help you remember where the, and don't worry about this, this was, I like this image, but I don't like this part, it gets a little complicated, um, where we're making CO2, where we're making ATP, where we're making our electron carriers, and this guy is just the same as that guy, where we're using all our electron carriers for oxidation phosphor, oxidative phosphorylation, where we're putting in oxygen and where we're getting out water. The way I suggest you studying this, perhaps you print out a blank um, chart and practice filling it in. Draw a cell with mitochondria and show where all the stages go. Show where all the products and all the reactants come out because I can guarantee you, I'll ask you where these things are used and where these things are made.